everyone. We're going to start in uh, 90 seconds, maybe 60. So good afternoon. We're um, at the fourth, four to four thirty session. This is the uh, features session. Students speak, examining the impact of longitudinal program participation on learning outcomes. We've set up, I think, a really exciting um, um, ninety-minute session today, where we have a combination of uh, two components going on. First, we're going to do a sort of deep dive into looking at two programs that have, or three programs really, that have um, taken it upon themselves to sort of do long-term collaboration and work with students. And we want to look at how those programs have um, tried to understand the learning pathways of the kids who are coming to, I won't even call them the kids, the young adults who are coming through those programs. Um, and so we have both um, Caitlin Martin and Natalie Rutz from, Caitlin from Digital Youth Network. Sorry, I got to get this for me. Um, <laughs> Natalie Rusk, which is who's representing uh, MIT, but uh, Computer Clubhouse and Scratch, um, who are going to do the first part of the conversation that's helping us understand the uh, learning pathways. And then what's really good, we, this is called Student Speaks. So what we're going to have, uh, Mimi Ito is going to lead a conversation with four fabulous young ladies who are all in college or out of college, um, who are all participants, have been long-term participants in, in, in programming, either at uh, DYN, Scratch, Computer Clubhouse, or in the learning labs out in, uh, in, in Pima. Um, so we're going to first start off with, okay, Caitlin, you're going to go first? Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Pathways Through the Digital Youth Network. And I'm sure some of you have heard lots about DYN from Nicole and other people at um, DML. But I'm going to sort of summarize what the program was at the time that we had this opportunity to do some longitudinal research on youth. And, um, and then I'm going to share a couple pathways that we were able to document. So first, the DYN goals for the youth at this time was that youth going through DYN programs would develop technological fluencies to create and critique digital media. They'd um, develop identities as powerful users and creators of that media. And they'd also develop social learning orientations, so as they collaborated with learned from and taught others in their community. Um, so I'm going to talk about DYN as it was at one point in time, because it's grown and morphed and evolved into lots of different things. So I'm talking about DYN at a school called Renaissance Academy. And this was really the first instance of DYN. And it very purposefully set out to design across different contexts that youth spend their time. So after school programs, school, and online, and hopefully the online letting kids do some of this work at home. Um, so in school, there were mandatory classes that were going on in digital media, all three grades. Um, and there were also some cross collaborations between core curriculum teachers like science and history with the DYN programming as well during school. So all kids participated in that. After school, Kids had the opportunity to stay in clubs that were called pods, and they happened every day, two hours after school, in topics including digital video, robotics, graphic design, spoken word, video game design, um, and there were also other sorts of unstructured 
time. Um, Freedom Fridays was a forum where kids could come and showcase their work they were doing in DYN, and also just they could hang out after school and have access to these tools and mentors, which brings me to the big thing that's tying all of this together were adult mentors that were working both in the school, with the teachers, after school, and really supporting these kids online and in person. Um, so just a little bit about Renaissance Academy so you can sort of ground the cases that I'm going to share. It was an urban charter, it is an urban charter school, uh, middle school, sixth to eighth grade. They had a one-to-one -one laptop initiative, which was important. So the online network really allowed kids to take their laptop home and still be doing DYN work at home. It had 150 students, all of whom were African American, and about two-thirds were eligible for subsidized lunch. So just a really brief bit about our, the research. It was a longitudinal study, so we went in knowing we were going to follow kids from 6th through 8th grade to see what happened. Um, we have a quantitative look at one grade cohort, so we started in 6th grade and did surveys all the way through to 8th grade. Um, and we also went deeper and did qualitative case portraits of nine learners from this cohort. And that's all I'm going to say, but I'm just plugging a 9 o'clock session tomorrow morning if you want to learn more about the research and the methods that we used in this study. And that will be, Bridget Barron will be covering that. Um, so one thing that the research let us do, and this sort of ties back to Luis Gomez's talk of, you know, it's not just about the great idea. It's about really trying to distill the practices that have to be in place for these things to happen and for them maybe to be replicated in other places. And I know this diagram is sort of busy, but basically the things I wanted you to take away was that on the left hand, we have these DYN program practices. So things that mentors were doing, that kids were having um, the opportunity to do. And some of these were intentional from the beginning and some of them evolved over time. They just sort of were things that started to come about dependent on the context and the kids. And over time, kids start to take this up. So that's the right-hand side where kids are appropriating this process and start to find their own opportunities, take their knowledge outside of DYN, outside of the school, and start to know who to go to to secure support for the things that they want to work on. So I just want you to have some of these things in mind as I'm talking through the cases. And a little bit more. So the practices of seeding work um, were in DYN that were really salient were project-based assignments, so kids doing cycles of work and revision, a lot of collaborative work, some was tied to core content, some was based on student interest. Contests and competition really drove work sometimes, and sometimes it was school-based, other times it was um, citywide or national competitions like the first robotics Lego League. Um, and also, Connections to the broader community. So all these mentors came into DYN with connections to their own professional field of digital video or spoken word or robotics and brought these connections into the class. And this is a YouTube shot of interviews with pretty famous people that DYN kids were doing, including Dougie Fresh and Common. And I was just finding this clip and I found DYN interviews that kids were doing with Arnie Duncan as well. So really bringing the outside in was another way to spark projects. Supporting identities, um, positioning kids as contributors was really big. And this was something that was more emergent. I don't know that it was an intentional thing, but it came about as really important. An online learning network, so kids were able to share ideas and really develop who they were online. And also these regular forums after school for sharing and reflecting and exploring issues relevant to the Renaissance community. And as DYN has scaled, that's changed. But at this particular community, it was um, very Afrocentric and what was going on in that neighborhood at that time. So all kids participated in the school, act, in the school day DYN activities, including media arts classes. Almost all had a remix profile page. And 85% participated in at least one after school pod. But of course, there's variability in how the kids moved through that system from sixth to eighth grade. Um, so how they utilized the opportunities they had, who was involved in their learning, and what they did with that knowledge. So I'm gonna share two cases now, or as much as I have time for. Um, so the first one I wanna start with is Calvin. 
And so I know this is super hard to see. This is what we call a visualization, visualization of a techno-learning biography, or techno-biography. Um, and so across the x-axis, this represents time. So on your left-hand side, we have pre-K going all the way through eighth grade. So sixth through eighth grade, we were there on the ground documenting what was happening. And through interviews, we asked kids about to reflect on their technological learning activities prior to sixth grade. And we developed these maps as a way to see what was happening. So time is x, and along the y are different settings. So at the bottom, the brown activities are home. The blue is school. The um, green layer is after school, in this case, pods. And then the top orange layer is community, so sort of online or outside of school beyond DYN. And then this top gray area is the learning network. So who is involved in each of those activities that were happening over time? And again, their color coding sort of matches. So if you see some blue things, those are school collaborations. And the learning network is made up of people they learned from, people they were teaching, and people they were collaborating with. So Calvin. As you can see, not much happening prior to middle school at all. Um, one th he, little, a few games in pre-K. Uh, the brown node at the bottom that goes all the way from first grade to eighth grade, that's playing video games. He was super, super into games and gaming. Um, so sixth grade, he came into DYN and got a laptop. And to Calvin, he was a kid where that was really new to him. I never had my, own, my very own computer where I got to take home. I never had that. That's why I'm so excited. So that was in sixth grade. And you can tell, after sixth grade, Calvin's technobiography sort of takes off. Um, so now I'm just zooming in on Calvin, sixth through eighth grade. And one thing that Calvin did that I find really interesting that wasn't the same for many participants is he participated not only in pods in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So the green layer there are the after school programs, but he remained in the same pods. So the top one is video game design, all three years. Uh, he also did robotics, all three years. He also did video editing, all three years. And the fourth year, he actually added a fourth pod, which was um, graphic design. So he was really invested in spending his time in these pods. Um, whoops. So the video gaming, of course, really matched. He came into the program loving gaming, and all of a sudden he realized he could make his own, and he took off with it. Um, he also loved just the open-endedness of these after-school pods. Unlike school, there was no time frame. You didn't have to finish something at a certain time. You could work on a project for the entire year. And Calvin, who was working with Scratch, was totally obsessed with Naruto, which is an um, anime cartoon. And so I don't know if you could read it, but all three years he had a Naruto game that he was working on. So there's Naruto 1 in sixth grade, there's Naruto 2 in seventh grade, and Naruto 3 in eighth grade. And these are like multi-month projects he's working on. And then down at the bottom, he also at home made a Naruto video. So the after-school open-ended interest-based projects really spoke to him, and he was able to pursue very doggedly his Naruto video game design work. Um, so at the end of eighth grade, through all his pods especially, he made at least 20 different media projects that we knew of, so there's probably more, outside of class requirements, so outside of what was uh, required in school including movies, games and simulations, using three different kinds of um, introductory programming environments. Scratch was his favorite, Natalie. Uh, one robot, uh, robotics project using Lego Mindstorms, and also publications and graphics using um, Comic Life, but also professional Photoshop software. So what happened here is something super interesting. He developed this huge portfolio and he began to be recognized and promoted as a designer. So all of a sudden, his peers and mentors started to recognize Calvin as a game designer. He was asked in this instance to uh, be videotaped talking about a game that he made, Hulk versus Superman. 
And that was posted on YouTube, and it was called, it's part of a series called um, Behind the Remix. So mentors would tap people they thought had something to say to share their work and talk about behind the scenes how they created these things. So this went live. This was not only on the um, social network within DYN, but this is on YouTube. And what happened is Calvin really was repositioned. He not only was positioned as a creator, he was repositioned. He was somebody prior to DYN who had a reputation, both he would talk about it, his peers and his teachers, as maybe somebody who wasn't that great at school. He had trouble organizing his work. He had tr uh, trouble with traditional literacy, so reading was sort of complicated for him. And he had tons of ideas, but people saw them as really random, and he did too, and just all over the place. Through DYN, that random, full of ideas person was shifted, and he was really creative. As one mentor said, Calvin has the ability to shoot the ideas out simultaneously, any ideas, and then pull them back in and tie them up together and put it down in front of you. And that was his focused work. When he was allowed to work on his own projects, he did an amazing job. He also then started to do that appropriating the process. He and his relationship with Hondo started to go to Hondo for help. So he says, when I do a school project, I'll go to Hondo to get some feedback on design. When I was doing one project, I told him, there, are there any design tips that he could give me? And he said, maybe more, make it like this. And that's what I did. And then when I looked at it, it looked a whole lot better. So he knew who the experts were in different areas, and he was going to them for help to improve his projects. He also started sharing his knowledge out. And through the three years in the game design program, the mentors shifted a lot. They changed mentors. And Calvin really became the expert in Scratch. And so he started teaching his brother Scratch because he was nervous that when he left, who, who would help? Who would help the other kids? So he says, and when, I, when he, his, brother, his little brother, comes to DYN, I can teach him how to use Scratch. So then if he ever goes into the pod, he will know a lot of stuff about Scratch. So at least some type of expert who normally uses Scratch will be there. So he's projecting what he's learned out to his family. Um, even though this is so great and his story is amazing, there were challenges. So he has a lot of ideas. He's appropriating the process. He's doing this great portfolio of work, but he doesn't share it. He doesn't promote himself. So as he says, I produce a lot, but I also forget to post it, but I do a lot. So there's not much evidence or trace of him on Remix and his work. And the laptop, remember, was school issued. So at graduation, he says, it's going to be kind of difficult leaving my laptop next year, I mean, in high school. So I'm trying to get at least as far as I can with all my games and my videos that I made. So when I have to turn it in, I can at least say I had some good times. So despite this, he has some major plans for the future. He was headed to a technology-focused charter high school. And he was really excited about a future in game design and engineering. And this is one of my favorite quotes from him. When I apply for an engineering job, I will say I have had 11 years with working with technology from middle school to college. I remember one of my friends asked, why do you want 11 years of technology? I just said, because I just need it. I just want to make a good foundation. So once that foundation is finished, then I can start getting a job. Then one day, maybe I will make history. Um, and so Ruby, I'm going to go through a little faster, but just I want to show another way that a student, same cohort as Calvin, went through this system. And already you can tell it's different. Even though I know you can't read anything, her pod participation is, is there wasn't a lot going on. She wasn't staying after school and participating in pods. Um, Ruby was sort of came into sixth grade. Um, as a pretty shy girl who was very focused on academics and did very well. Uh, a mentor describing her said she kind of got swept under, being a quiet kid who just wants to get her work done. If I could say there was a weakness, I would say I don't think she really has the confidence she really deserves because she does great work. Um, so what Ruby did is she took some of the things she was learning in the DYN classes in school. She was learning, see now I can't read it, she was learning um, graphic design and web design. And she at home was doing a ton of writing. She wrote poems, she wrote stories, and they were on her own time and they were personal to her. So what she did is took 
the things she was learning in school, took them home and decided to make a digital version of all her writing, to put it together, package it, and she started to show mentors and suggest that they take a look. Um, and the mentors responded. So even though this wasn't a pod, this wasn't ha anything to do with school, she was showing some of her private personal work that she had done at home using the skills she got from the DYN school program. Um, Brother Mike especially was really influential. And as she says, it's just easier to talk to mentors because they always seem like they listen, even if it's not about DYN or whatever. They seem like you can talk to them and they'll help a lot. It's like they can understand everything that you tell them. Uh, seventh grade, especially, she couldn't participate in any pods, so she had trouble just going to pods because she didn't have a ride home. Something as simple as that was keeping her from things she wanted to do a pod with Brother Mike. So what she did is she emailed Brother Mike and Asia, who um, Brother Mike was the spoken word pod and Asia was the digital queendom pod, and had them email her assignments every week that they were giving to the pod participants, and she was doing them at home. So she was sort of taking things from one context and bringing them into another so she still could get this work done. Um, and then her identity started to shift. I just started doing things I know I normally wouldn't. Like we had this opening ceremony and they asked me to recite a poem. If I were in sixth or seventh grade, I would have been like, no, I don't want to be the center of attention. But I decided to do it and it actually worked out pretty well. But I guess I decided that I want to be remembered like after I'm gone, I guess, and I want to be seen. So through sharing her work with her mentors and brother Mike in particular, she started to own her voice. Um, I'm not going to read the quote because I don't have much time, but she was participating in other after-school programs, one of which was called um, Young Heroes. So it was an after-school sort of service-based thing, and they were doing service learning, but she said sometimes they wanted to make videos, like public service announcements, and nobody knew how to make videos. So she, again, took that knowledge she had at DYN and taught it to the people that were in her after-school group. She also started entering competitions in eighth grade, both school and national, and winning them. So one of them was a, um, they're actually both projects about Obama, one of which she was sketching famous people as part of her work. But she won prizes for both of these things and really started to build her identity as somebody who had something to say. Um, Plans for the future, she was headed to a selective enrollment public high school, and she was considering a future in acting, but leaving her options open. Right now I want to be an actress, I think, but I still want to go to college because school is important to me. I'm trying to find a way to do that. At one point I was thinking about being a doctor because I think your career should be something important, and I feel like there's really no nothing more important than if I can save somebody's life. So after middle school, we really don't know all that much about these kids. We, through some qualitative surveys, we know they were dropping in at Digital Youth Network and UMedia. We know they were using their school skills at high school. We know they were supporting family, so using their technology to help out parents. And we know they were pursuing more personal goals. But we're not quite sure, so I'm really excited to hear from our DYN representative over here. But really a call to find more ways to follow kids longitudinally to find out what impact these interventions do have on later in their life. And thanks, acknowledgments. And we have a book coming out, uh, so a little plug for our book, and there are little flyers up here. But it tells this story in a lot more detail and more cases and more information.
So a little over 20 years ago in downtown Boston, not far from here, I was working at the Computer Museum in a small museum that is now not there, but uh, luckily the program that we started there lives on. So at the time, it was school vacation week, and I had borrowed a set of Lego materials for a week to offer for any families who came by doing the programmable Lego that Mitchell Resnick at the MIT Media Lab and others in the group were, had developed and were developing new technologies. And during the week, as families dropped in, there was also a group of kids who were coming every day. And one of them in particular got really excited when he was able to turn a motor on in his hand. And he said, mira, mira, he was telling his friends in Spanish to come look and see. And then over the week they were building and we had materials for them to see how they could build contraptions and they came back every day. And then the next week, if school vacation was over, I had returned the materials to the media lab and the elevator door opened one afternoon and there was no one in our museum and there was this group of kids and they saw me and they said, Lego logo, the programmable Lego. And I said, oh no, we don't have it right now. And they looked disappointed, but they were browsing the exhibits. Well, about a week or two later, I got an email that said, there's some kids sneaking in the museum and if you see them, call security. And I said, oh no, no, I know who those kids are. They're here to learn <laughs> and they want to make things. And so, through a series of events, I started looking around if there were any other computer centers in the area where they could be building with programmable Lego and making things. And there were some pretty far away, but there were some community centers. Again, this is more than 20 years ago. Some community technology centers. But for kids, it was, it was educational games and word processing at the time. And there wasn't a lot of creating and making. So through a lot of people's work, we ended up starting, it took more than a year to get all the funding to start these computer clubhouses. And the principles really came out of the work of the MIT Media Lab, Timur Papert's group, um, Mitchell and others, developing the theory of constructionism of this whole idea of learning through designing and building on young people's interests, following their interests and the motivation from that, but also building a community of mentors. Again, a lot of similar themes with DYN and having a area where you could have a music studio, you could be building Lego and, and drawing and all kinds of different things so that there are different pathways for different interests. And the whole thing, a really important part of it in order for kids to take risks was to have an environment of trust and respect. And this is now called the Clubhouse Learning Model and it continues in amazing variation around the world. So at the Museum of Science, and we have other people here and you'll hear from Jalisa who works at the Computer Clubhouse in Tacoma. So around the world, there's a hundred sites that Gail Breslow, Daniel Martin, other people from the Museum of Science in collaboration with MIT and Intel funding a whole range and using those principles in amazing ways. And each site has their own specialty and things that they get engaged with. So it's really been an amazing thing. And I remember we just had the 20th anniversary computer clubhouses, but at the 10 year anniversary, someone from Intel said, have you ever thought of having a virtual computer clubhouse? And I said, no, do not do that. Because I just knew how important those face-to-face -face interactions with mentors and now the annual conference that happens with computer clubhouses for the, and there's also a teen summit where people get together from around the world and share. And this face-to-face -face time is really important for a lot of different reasons. So at the time, I was very against that idea. But in 2003, we started working on a program called Scratch, which you've heard about, a lot of you know about, but a programming language. And one of the inspirations was seeing in computer clubhouses, youth were making a lot of things. Some of them were programming robots, but not a lot of them were programming interactive media. And we saw this real opportunity with the internet, some of the other tools we had seen, to have a programming language where they could create and then share their creations online. And so, got funding from National Science Foundation 2003, launched the programming environment, but also a website, an online community that 
is the Scratch online community. This is now the newer version of Scratch that our Lifelong Kindergarten group has launched. And this I just took this morning. We're almost at 5 million projects shared over the past six years. So this online community has really grown. And I think one of the things that I've learned is we had seen it as a programming language and an online community where you can share. But I started to, and I'll show you why, I'm starting to realize that this is, in a way, I don't want to say a virtual clubhouse, but it has those elements of a youth program. And the youth are telling me this. I now am seeing it that way, and we're needing to think of it that way, the staff who are working on Scratch and contributing to it. And you'll hear from Sarah, who, who's a longtime community member and now contributing. So about nine months ago, I wanted to understand better why some of the young people who are on the site, why do they do it? And also in order to understand, because some kids take off with it, but others don't. And so we wanted to understand better what, what is keeping those ones engaged and what are, are there many different reasons? So we put out a call. We have these regular Scratch Design Studios. So for one of them, we said the Scratch team, which is us that... MIT want to know why, what do you like to do in Scratch, why? And that was really the question. That's all we want to know. We just want to know, just make a project about it. And we got, in just a couple weeks, 130 projects or so. And there's just a lot. I'm continually reading over and I'm analyzing the themes. And I was just so surprised by a lot of it. And I think um, I, think I had thought that each, because we know some are really interested in games, like Calvin, some are really interested in art, so I thought there would be much more of that coherent thing. But a lot of them said, like this one, top five reasons I love Scratch more than anything. And this was a young woman, which we, we didn't know about her beforehand. She was 12 at the time. And she laid out, and I'm focusing on her because she brought out a lot of the reasons that we heard in other ones, too. So she, she did it like on... TV, she started with number five, so for her top five, an outlet. Scratch allows people to be creative on so many different levels. On Scratch, you can be anything, an artist, a programmer, a musician, a writer, and so much more. The world is really your oyster, and whatever you want to make, you can. And this is really the top reason we heard is, like, because you can make things. She also talked about feedback, but I'm in the interest of time and going on. So the third one, she said, friends. Scratch is, although it is sad to admit, the place on earth where I feel as though I belong and fit in. I thought for a while before making this project why that is, and I realized that it's your friends that make your world, and I have more good friends on Scratch than anywhere else. I love all my friends, and Scratch would not be Scratch without them. Then she talks about experience. Before I was on Scratch, I really didn't know anything about programming. One day I decided to want, wanted to learn some programming. I found Scratch. Now my dream in life is to be a programmer when I grow up. And after only half a year of Scratch, I'm already finding it easier to learn other programming languages, such as Java, because I learned Scratch first. Then she goes on to say, it's the same with art. I didn't know how to draw before Scratch, but the amazing artists here inspired me to start drawing. Now it's one of my passions. I learned so much from scratch, it wasn't hard. See, some people say it's hard. <laughs> she didn't think it find it hard. I learned it in one day and made my first game. Ever since then, I knew I wanted to do with my life, and I'll never forget Scratch for giving me that. In fact, I think I want to work on the Scratch team as a programmer when I grow up. But you would not believe how many, and I've had kids ask on my profile, girls and boys, how old do you have to be to be on the Scratch team? <laughs> so there is a lot of interest in that and interest in... Um, and then she goes on the top number one reason, community. And this is what we heard over and over, too. The best thing about Scratch to me is the amazing, amazing community of people to work with. I love doing all sorts of collabs with people, and I love seeing what others do as inspiration. The whole website and the ability to post projects and look at others easily is what makes Scratch different from all other programming languages out there. So again, this idea of community where I start to see these themes of, in the computer clubhouse about friendships, learning, but also it's the people and the relationships that they're talking about. I look to see for a lot of all these kids, are they still online? And this, I just looked, actually the one in the top left, she posted yesterday scratch facts about the, that we're reaching 5 million projects now. There was a call to make projects about that. And she, she calculated actually her percent of, her 126 out of 5 million, what percent of all scratch projects are hers. <laughs> um, but when you looked, I wanted to see if we look at the data, because we have a lot of data that we're gathering. 
about what young people are doing. So we have a lot of information on their projects, but also at a very micro level about all the changes they make and where they're, how they're building code over time. And this is the last five projects she made, with one, number one being the one she made yesterday, in terms of number of blocks. And these are all in, so number five she made in January. So she's made about a project a month, a little more than that. Uh, yeah, I guess a couple a month um, since January. And what's interesting, you see number four, there's a whole bunch of blocks. So the more recent ones don't have as many blocks. And I think when a lot of people think about kids learning to code, it's like they're getting better and better and they're using more and more blocks and concepts. But when we look back at, well, what were the last five projects? On the top left, like I said, it's about the celebrating five million projects. The one about, the other one is Minecraft photos. It only has a couple blocks because it's just showing Minecraft photos that she likes. And, that, um, and then there's one that's this kind of social thing where you're, they're talking about, that's her persona online. And then the one with a lot of blocks is she suddenly made this ball catapult engine. And she said, I got the ideas from others and she's using variables and calculations. She said, I learned from others, but I did all the programming myself. And she said, I know it still goes. So anyway, there's still a little bit of, she said, it's always kind of going. But she's making this using gravity and scratch, so using a pretty complex set of blocks. And then the one before that was just two blocks, and it's her playing on her flute. And there's other projects where it's, you know, things with other people in the community where there, she's remixing for a contest or doing music or what have I been doing recently. So the thing is, it's not just a story about getting better and better coding. It's more like, what does she want to show you right now? She's using it really as an expressive medium. And so I think it's really interesting. And over time, so we have the data about the number of blocks and the concepts, which is important, but it also trying to look at the bigger picture about how is she using it in her life, and how is she connecting with others online, but also bringing in her other interests offline. So some of the, the narratives from all of these ways that young people are talking about using why they scratch, and that was the thing, we just said, why do you scratch, but they started talking about, that was my biggest surprise, is so many of them said, well, I started when I was in kindergarten, then I stopped for a couple years, then I started again, and then here's what I'm doing now, and then in the future, here's what I'm planning. So many of them were thinking developmentally and giving us this developmental trajectory, even though we just said, why do you scratch? So it's really pushing our team to think more about that we need to develop, because a lot of them are on for longer periods of time, over time. So how can we make it to support them in thinking about, like she realized a few months ago that it was her scratch anniversary. It's her anniversary of scratch. So she made a project celebrating. Um, and that's where she said a year ago she wanted to be a ballerina. Now she wants to be a programmer. And, um, but how can we do more in their profile and in, in other ways helping them developmentally, thinking of it as a thing that they're involved in over time? So the themes we've seen developmentally, making friends, improving through practice. A lot of them said, I started really simple, or I didn't do very well at the beginning. Some of them want to delete that path. Um, learning from others' work, expanding projects, and broadening to different interests. Managing their motivation, which is a real challenge. Like, I start a project, sometimes it's hard to finish, but often they get motivated seeing someone else's work. That spurs them on, or getting a comment from someone spurs them on and a lot of them thinking about, and some of them said, this is launching my career in comics or in music, not just programming. So it's really interesting that there's multiple pathways. So one of the ways, so um, Rick Roseroke and Amos Blanton, who's the project manager for the online community, we worked on writing up some of the emergent roles that youth have taken on. And this is something that, and also Eric, who's joined us, is working on this idea of making more youth roles. And in youth programs like DYN and Computer Clubhouse, youth start taking on more responsibility and roles in after school programs. So we're seeing that some of them are taking this on spontaneously. And we want to make pathways so that others can start to see what else can I do. Some of them are asking, OK, I was a new scratcher. Now I'm a scratcher. What's next? How can I help? How can I join the team? So making ways that they can be counselors, there's scratch mentors, there's a welcoming committee, you can nominate yourself to be a curator, but we're also coming up with new ways you can help people with scripts. 
So, um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. But <laughs> there's more. There's so many different stories, like I said, of young people over time and telling us their narratives. It's really exciting that we're going to be working on. If you want to see more of other people have done work on Scratch Research, if you just Google Scratch Research, there are a lot of papers on different aspects of the Scratch Research that are going on. Thanks so much, uh, Caitlin and Natalie, for giving us all that rich background on the programs. Um, I'm Mimi, and I like to hang out with this community, and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to engage with both, you know, this mixed panel of, you know, the people who have been some of the folks behind these amazing programs, but, you know, even more importantly, you know, what makes it all worth it is to see these amazing young adults that have, um, you know, been through the program over the years. Uh, so really happy to be able to play a bit of an MC role uh, in this panel. So I wanted to start just by uh, letting all of our uh, um, all of our uh, youth participants uh, tell your story about um, if you could. We'll go one by one. Um, if you could, you know, just say how you found out about the program, how you first got involved, what was your involvement. Uh, and whether you still have a relationship. University of Oklahoma right now and I was and still am a member of the Scratch community. I started using Scratch um, when I was in the eighth grade. I found it completely on accident uh, one day at home because uh, I was just uh, googling. I wanted to know if there was a way that I could make a video game. Um, so I was googling found Scratch. And so I got really into it in high school. And I started, rather than making video games um, as I originally intended, I started getting really into making math projects and projects that might teach math to other Scratch users. And I got really um, into the Scratch community and I really enjoyed uh, helping other Scratchers. And I um, got involved in some of the roles that Natalie was talking about before. Uh, and now I work for uh, the Scratch team, um, and I'm involved still in the online community.
all of you, just like all young people today, have so many invitations, so many opportunities. Um, you know, I think Jonathan Wirth in his session yesterday was saying, you know, as uh, educators who are in the, you know, purveying information, we're going head to head with the internet for young people's attention. So good luck with that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sort of curious, what about these programs kept you involved, given everything else and, you know, all of your schoolwork and other interests that you have? I don't know if somebody wants to jump in on that question. Oh, I can go. Yeah. Uh, so for me, a big part of that was the mentors. So the director of our clubhouse, um, Ms. LaVersa Sullivan, she really made sure she connected with everybody who walked through the door. Um, she also made sure that the volunteers there connected with everyone who walked through the door. Um, I remember one day I was sitting down and I didn't really like programming, I just like taking pictures and using a program called Goo to make the pictures look funny. Um, I was sitting there on Goo and Miss LaVersa came in with a bunch of computers and she said, who wants to help take, a, uh, take apart the computers? And I didn't say anything, I just kept playing and she's like, Jaleesa, come back here. And if Miss LaVersa told you to do something, you had to do it. So I did it and there was only a few of us girls who went back there and then um, we ended up taking a break and she said, you know, if you're really not interested, you can go back in there. And I stayed and by the end I realized, oh, I'm the only girl in here. And so, um, you know, Miss LaVersa, she really just pushed me because she knew that I was capable of more than what I did. In school, it was easy for me to just do the minimal and still get an A, but Miss LaVersa, she knew that I was capable of doing way more than that. And so then um, I would just start finding ways to um, bring my schoolwork into the clubhouse. I made an interactive CD-ROM about Romeo and Juliet because I hated the project that my English teacher gave me. And so um, just having those mentors there to push me and tell me that I could do more, it really kept me in the program. Mm, that's a great story. Um, I completely agree. A uh, big part of why I stayed with uh, DYN and media and period in general is because of my mentors. But um, I just say a bigger aspect of it for me was just the, um, the gratification that I got for, it from my, for myself. Uh, Media makes me feel like I'm doing something important. If everything I create, I feel like people see it and it, I feel like my work matters. And a lot of times, especially at Oberlin, which is a pretty prestigious institution, um, I feel like I'm getting drowned out. And now, um, and it's sometimes it could just be really difficult, um, you know, navigating different spaces like that. But when I come back into a space like this, for instance, I feel like this is where I need to be. And I was just telling um, one of my, uh, mentors that I guess I work with now, <laughs> but um, that I, I, I need to be in more spaces like this because this is where I feel like I belong and that, that's pretty much why I do it. And now um, over the summer mostly um, when I work with DYN, I have a lot of interactions with kids um, and so I see myself in them who aren't really engaged in the work that they're doing because it's kind of boring and it's just really straight for writing and stuff like this and you really don't it doesn't let you take advantage of the skills that you have when um, you have such strict guidelines and things like that. And so anytime I take a class at Oberlin, especially, and they give us the, if it says uh, your final project will be a 25 page paper or you can do something else, if you talk to me, I'm there the next day like, okay, so what else can I do? Can I uh, make this movie for you or something? So, um, so that's, a lot of why I'm, I'm still involved with it now. And I really just want to be able to help other kids from that age, because I think it really matters when you start really young as well, because if I would have, I mean, technology skills, it's, it's, it's really dense now. Um, and there's a, long, a large curve on it now. Um, I mean, I don't do coding and stuff like that. I'm more of a video person or picture photography kind of thing, um, so. Um, just going off of that, I think both those are really, Good points, and it's just, I think what has kept me is like empowerment. Um, I'm part of a group, or I'm part of a, I, I'm allowed to make decisions about helping other people and about myself, and my voice is heard. And that's so valuable, especially when you go to school and you just have to sit there and do your work. There's not really any other spaces where you can share your story with people, and that's mm -hmm. really, it means a lot. Hmm. Sarah, do you wanna jump in? 
things that uh, kept me um, interested in Scratch or really got me interested and had my interest continue was that I was able, uh, with Scratch, I was able to uh, connect interests I had outside of Scratch uh, to my Scratch program. So when I really got involved in Scratch was when I realized that I could make projects related to another one of my passions, which was uh, math. Um, and I think also the other thing that kept me involved uh, was the community and uh, sort of having this community of people that could uh, be an audience for what I was making and also people that I could give feedback to. Um, so both mentors and mentees on the Scratch website, I think definitely kept me coming. And, you know, I think some of these themes of, you know, the relationships that are built, that sense of shared purpose, the opportunity to share work and in a meaningful way. I mean, I think these are really pointing to some of the unique characteristics of these environments and, you know, some of the ways that they're embodying these principles that we're trying to talk about as connected learning that are, you know, unique from a lot of other spaces that any of us actually have an opportunity to participate in. So I think what we all agree that these are amazing young women, and we'd all like to take credit for how awesome they are. Uh, my next question is, so how much credit do these programs really get for how awesome you are? I mean, what, what influence do you think it, you know, the participation in this program uh, that you were involved in had in you know, the way you learned in your future and what, what you have planned for your future? We don't have to go in the same order. I don't know. Do we should mix it up, Shani? You um, okay. <laughs> I guess I'll go first. Um, I'd say that they get a, a large part of the credit for even why, well, they could take all of the credit for why I'm, why I'm at Oberlin, period. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not saying I wouldn't be in college, but I don't think that I'd be in nearly as good of a school if it wasn't for that um, because my involvement with DYN is so extensive and I've done so much. You guys should see my resume. I mean, even though DYN covers almost the whole thing, I've done so much in DYN that it's like pages. And so every time I go to the career services, they're like, you gotta take some of this stuff out. We can't send it out like this. Um, and I'm like, but all of it's essential and stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, and so I say they get a big part of the credit, but um, I, I wouldn't attribute everything to it just because uh, it does take a lot of dedication on your own, and I had to get that from myself and from my mom, my family, and stuff like that. If I didn't have someone like my mother at home who was pushing me to get involved in these kind of programs, then I wouldn't have done it because, I mean, sometimes I'm a kid, if I'm, when I'm growing up, I, kids are lazy half the time, and we don't really want to do anything extra, extra if we don't have to. And so um, she played a huge role in trying to make sure that I was uh, in diversified communities and not just uh, by race and things like that, but um, in, in what we were learning and stuff like that. So technology, going, being in Girl Scouts and stuff like that. She wanted me to be in different kinds of communities. And, um, but the reason I still give DYN a lot of credit is because um, while I've been at school, I felt, I felt pretty alienated in some ways. Um, and just like I don't identify with the culture there very much because everybody at Oberlin is really activist goal and let's be, you know, change the world without using any resources um, because they're very sustainable and stuff like that. But I'm all like technology, technology, and sometimes it kind of like makes me want to rebel against it in some ways. But when I come back into these spaces um, and because of DYN, I have a different perspective and I know what it can do for me. So that's a big part of the reason why they do get a lot of credit for where I am right now. Um, I guess I can go. I, I've only been in the program for a year, so I think that it has had an effect on me, but maybe not as big an effect of an effect. Um, but I think it has made me, like I said about empowerment and having a voice, it's made me wanna affect my community and make change in my community and create a space like the spaces that they've been able to go to. Um, and I'm majoring in e-society now, which is kind of related, <laughs> but yeah. Sarah, you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah um, I'd say it, it. Scratch had a huge effect on the path I decided to take through school. Um, prior to using Scratch, I 
I was pretty actually afraid of computers. Um, and so uh, Scratch sort of taught me that I could be creative um, on computers and make really cool things with computers. And um, it inspired me to major in computer science as I am now. And I also think it just uh, affected the way I think about computer science and um, how I think about the different applications of computer science. Uh, so I would say, yeah, Scratch definitely had an influence. Um, the Computer Clubhouse had a huge impact on um, where I am today. Um, through the clubhouse, I was able to go to different conferences and do presentations. And it'd be funny because it'd be like me and my sister and other people at the clubhouse, and we're like the only kids, and there's just a bunch of old white men presenting, <laughs> and then there's us. And we're like, hi, you know, this is what we're working on. Um, I, through the clubhouse, I was able to get two high school internships at Microsoft. I was the only person from Tacoma. I would wake up at 4.30 in the morning every day in the summer to take three buses up to Microsoft and then come back. So I had no life. I would wake up early, go to sleep early. But um, it was because of the clubhouse. Um, our director took us to their um, Blacks at Microsoft Student Minority Day. Um, I ended up winning second place in an essay contest. I won a new computer for my house. Um, I was so excited because the computer that we had was really slow and I didn't like to use it. But um, even um, my choice of school, so I went to the University of Washington, and originally I thought I wanted to do computer science because um, I had done a lot of programming at the computer clubhouse. But I got there and I was like, this is boring. Um, we, did, we barely even, we didn't even touch a computer in the classroom. Um, we were writing things on paper, and I was like, this is really boring. But because of my participation in the computer clubhouse, I knew that um, I wanted to do engineering, but I wanted to be interactive. And so I studied human-centered design and engineering, and specifically human-computer human interactions. And then once I graduated, I didn't want to go work at Microsoft or Google or anything. Um, I did AmeriCorps. Um, and I went back to Tacoma, and I did AmeriCorps. And that's because I knew that I still wanted to be connected to my community. And so after AmeriCorps, um, I went back to the computer clubhouse, this time as the coordinator. Um, and you know, had I not participated in the computer clubhouse, there's no way that I um, would even have this perspective. You know, I might have, um, well, actually, when I first started the computer clubhouse, I just knew that I wanted to be a hairdresser. And that's not what I do now. Um, and actually, in the fall, I'll be returning to the University of Washington to get my master's degree. And um, so, yeah, the computer clubhouse had a big effect on my decisions. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Um, I want to invite people to um, maybe come up to the microphones. If you have questions for any of the panelists, I'll, I'll have another question, but just so you can be thinking and queuing up. And I also want to invite Natalie and Caitlin to ask questions and make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on something that Shawnee was saying just about your, how your mom's role in all of this. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about what the program does to support your engagement and the community building and the mentoring, but what do you all have in, you know, we're, we're really trying to puzzle through why, you know, what is it that um, young people need as supports to really take advantage of the opportunities? And you've all spoken really eloquently to how the opportunities have shaped you and opened up new, uh, the programs have opened up new opportunities for you. So why is it that, you know, other, I mean, you know, you have lots of peers and know other young people. What is it in your environment that really was maybe a unique support or, you know, maybe not so unique, but just a support that really you feel like you needed in order to be able to persist and, um, you know, accomplish the things you did? Okay, I guess it's time to pull up my start again. But um, so, okay, so a big part of it is one, I'll just start with the basic, kind of like the pressure, um, and not like a bad pressure, but just a pressure that any parent wants for their child to be something and to, to do something meaningful to them. And so um, for a little while, like, because I wasn't always really good in, or engaged, I would say, in my academics at all for a while. Um, and then when I started doing media, I started getting straight A's and everything. Um, and it didn't matter what it was, even math, and I wasn't using a computer for that. But um, my, uh, I didn't want to disappoint my mother. Um, so that played a large role in, 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 in me needing that and 
she also just really believed in me. So that, that, that's why I need that support system too. And also like, I think media and through DYN, I've gotten a lot of like, um, um, people can see my work. And so I've been able to get a lot of feedback, but I like to be able to take my work home and have people in my family, someone who's close to me, to be able to view my work and to be super proud that they can see that. Um, and they can see, and, and it's pretty tangible, you know, for them to, and for her to post it on her Facebook page or something like that and yeah. kind of brag about her daughter, you know, nice. all of that stuff really, really um, contributes to it. But I would say that one of the big differences is, though, with people who don't, have this at home because I have plenty of friends who don't have nearly as engaged parents in their lives is that um, the, the difference is kind of just having that person be there and my mom never helped me do any of this stuff you, like she's I mean she uses Excel because she's an accountant but um, other than that she uses it to surf the web and the most she does is download music from iTunes um, and so she never like helped me or anything but she kind of like provided access to all of that stuff and the funds and participated in digital media even with the one-on-one lap -on -one laptop program that I had in middle school and in high school. It's still expensive, the, uh, the, um, the software that you need for that kind of stuff. And a lot of my friends, they just don't have access to it, period. And mm -hmm. so while DYM might have gave me like the foundational tools for that um, to like get my peak, to get me interested in it, my mom was able to take that financial burden off for me and say money is not a problem if you're really going to use it to benefit you going forward. Mm -hmm. Right, so both sort of believing in you, personal supports, but also those concrete material things too. Any of the other panelists have? Um, I think it's just about a presence of programs as well. I know that when I was a kid or a young adult, I, ha I always have had a lot of ideas, but it's been really difficult for me to get them executed. I think it's both a, per both a personal issue, but also an issue of lack of resources in my community, because we live in kind of a small, spread out community, or lack of knowledge of resources. So um, what the youth design team has given me is like a resource, and I was someone reached out to me and told me to, to come to it and do this whole process. Um, and like, I guess that's kind of an obvious statement, like you need places to go in order to go there. But I think that it's about creating those networks and the ability to find them and have a great place to go when you do find them. Mm -hmm. so, did you have a question you wanted to pose? Uh, I hope you'll indulge me for a moment, but this question is directed at the um, panelists who have been both students of these programs and have moved into teacher, director, um, mentor positions in this program. And it's exciting to me because when I was an undergraduate at MIT, I was teaching through the lifelong kindergarten and the computer clubhouse and the boys and girls clubs of Boston. So I went to every single club and taught them how to edit video because they had a whole Adobe suite and nobody knew how to edit it. Um, and it was an independent project and I loved it. And as a teacher, obviously I was not a student of these programs, but as a teacher, it really changed the way that I interacted with media, I interacted with other people and it was very inspiring to me. And now I'm a professor of media psychology. So uh, I would really like for you to mention or talk about the being on both sides of the experience and um, what you're still learning as a director or a mentor in these programs. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I can speak about that. So um, one thing that's really, it's, it's still weird for me. Um, uh, it's been almost a year now that I've been in this position. And I want to say the first big shock was when I went to the annual conference last year there were people there, they're like, oh, hi, Julie. So they remember me, and I'm just like, I don't remember you. But, <laughs> you know, they remember me from when I was in the program, and um, I know that this coming summer, it's going to be even more of a big shock because I went to the very first teen summit that the Computer Clubhouse Network had, and I will be going this year as a mentor, as a, a chaperone, <laughs> and I still sometimes feel like I'm a kid myself. And so... Um, 
just being at the clubhouse every day, um, working with the youth, I just laugh and I'm just, you know, now I understand why Miss LaVersa was frustrated with us sometimes or, you know, um, it's really, it's just a weird experience being on the other side, um, but it also makes it easier for me to connect with the students. Some of them, um, I graduated from the same high school as them. Um, they all know that I went to the computer clubhouse, so, you know, if they tell me that they can't do something, then I tell them, you know what, I went through the same program as you, you have no excuse. And so um, it's, it's still a very unique um, experience that I'm going through right now. So. Um, I completely agree about it being weird sometimes when, because I feel like a lot of people know who I am and I'm like, yeah, I remember you. And I'm not, I don't really remember them, but I feel rude saying that I don't. Um, <laughs> and it's also just a little bit weird, like, because one great thing about DYN is that it keeps, its mentors have been there for so long. Um, and I mean, we get new ones and some of them fall away, but um, the ones who've been really core uh, or crucial to me coming through have been there. And so not being their student anymore. And so like kind of referring to them as a coworker and not my mentor is, has a weird thing going to it. But one thing that I will say that I have definitely learned, and I'm st not, not learned, because I'm still working on this for myself, especially when uh, this summer I was working with the, uh, the divas in Chicago for the uh, Chicago Summer of Learning. And that is, everyone learns differently. Like I, I already knew that because I experienced that with myself. Um, and media was my way to learn differently. But you know, media doesn't fit everyone. And so I'm still learning how to, because I think media is so moldable um, to other people's stuff. And so I, I'm still trying to figure out how to get these kids engaged because um, especially the, the, the age range that we work with, personally, I think that those are, that's the roughest age <laughs> that you can get work with girls. If it was my choice, like, over, like at school, I work with second graders and I, I love that because it's a lot <laughs> easier to kind of get them to do what you want to do and be excited about not that exciting stuff. Um, but working with 12 and 13 year olds, girls who are just about to go into eighth grade, who think they know everything and really are, don't know that much and don't care to learn anything new is really, really difficult. And trying to find ways to get them excited is something I'm still trying to figure out how to do um, and to get them engaged. And even if it doesn't have to do with media, because I, I recognize that not everybody is tech savvy and um, wants to do this kind of stuff, but I still feel like everyone has some type of potential. And so trying to find ways in the same way that DYN was able to spark something in me, find different ways to spark that in other people, um, and especially young ones and people who, you know, have different desires. Like stuff like fitting in is really, really important at that age. We think that it's just, oh, you don't fall for the peer pressure and stuff, but that kind of stuff is actually important to them. And so how can I navigate a space where I'm, make them feel like they're cool and like they have something to show off to their friends or something like that to make them want to learn because that stuff is all really important and so I'm still trying to learn how to take things that actually matter to them and and use what I know um, whether it's media or just my <coughs> therapist skills that I don't really have <laughs> to to um, to to help them that's great that was Sarah, you're living the dream as part of the Scratch team, so what's that been like for you? <laughs> just using Scratch the years and uh, having more leadership positions. Um, it was just a really good uh, learning experience for me to learn how to um, not only help on other users but also to understand what sort of went behind Scratch and all the uh, different decisions and everything that went into it. Um, so it's been it's been super exciting and, and fun. Um, and I, I guess the, the one of the challenges right now is I'm I'm helping develop the uh, the uh, helpers program. So to think about how to 
uh, give uh, make roles for other users to have leadership positions is something I've been thinking about. Question of you know when kids keep leveling up through the program and figuring out those transition points. I mean, being able to you know have the opportunity to reflect on um, your experience was over so many years is just really amazing. So, Nicole. Um, I've, given we have an all-female panel, I uh, wanted to ask this question, and it's to the students, but also to um, the researchers. And Mimi, I'm curious your thought about this. So there's a lot of you know, literature that says the importance of program participation in the middle school years, particularly for women um, uh, pursuing interest in STEAM or STEM-related careers. Um, and now we have this whole hour of code, and you know, let's just have kids code, just take a coding class. I'm curious, uh, for those of you who have majored in STEM in, in college or in, and continue to do that work, um, what is it, you know, can you speak about what, um, you've spoken about a little bit, but what is it about the experiences early on that um, enabled you to persist probably in oftentimes when you were in classes in college or in high school where, um, where you were probably the only one, one of few uh, women? So, um, Sorry, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. Um, so when I was at the University of Washington, there were a lot of times when um, I was one of few women or people of color in my classes. But um, it was because of my early years at the Computer Clubhouse. I started when I was in the seventh grade. Um, the first thing that I programmed was an interactive CD-ROM. Uh, for Black History Month, and it was called What If There Were No Black People? And so um, there's like a play about it, and I took the play, and I, um, somebody helped me make the characters, and I programmed it in Macromedia Director using Lingo. And to me, that was just so much fun, and I was able to show my mom. I was able to, you know, show people what I did. And then, like I said, when I was in the ninth grade, we had to read Romeo and Juliet and we were supposed to write a paper about it, and I went to my English teacher and said, can I do something else? So I made an interactive CD-ROM about that. And so um, just me being able to bring writing or design assignments to life, um, it really just motivated me to keep going. And so once I got to college, um, the computer science classes, they were really boring, and, but I knew that from my experience with the computer clubhouse that I could do more, I could bring my ideas to life. So I didn't get discouraged. I would um, go back to the clubhouse where I would call Miss LaVersa sometimes and I would just tell her, this is boring, I don't know how you did it. But you know, she would just tell me, just keep going because this is what you like to do. And so um, now I'm able to tell kids at the clubhouse, you know, like I was exactly where you are. And I went to the University of Washington who has a great computer science program. Um, has a great college of engineering, and I was able to do this, even if I was the only one sometimes, but if you guys do this and teach your friends how to do it, you guys can go, and you don't have to be the only one, and you can change the program. Um, for me, I, the, the, what I just know, especially just knowing myself, what's most crucial for me and having gotten started so early is, um, and I'm not trying to say this to make myself sound lazy, obviously, but, it's really hard to learn new things. Um, and so getting that experience while I was so young, being able to already know the programs I use at school in my cinema studies classes um, was crucial to me being able to excel in it because I can't imagine having, already having a class load of 16 to 18 plus credits um, and trying to you know, do film and not already knowing the software. That, I, I just couldn't even imagine it. And people would like to do stuff that's familiar to them. And you know, when you're younger and you're learning this new stuff, it really doesn't feel like, it, it doesn't feel so challenging. Um, it doesn't feel like a task because you, you're young and you don't know everything. That's kind of like what people are for around you is to help you learn new things. And so it doesn't feel like as much of a task to learn new stuff. But ask me how I feel now about trying to learn Photoshop, which I've tried to learn a million times and I have given up. I'd rather just use Instagram filter to do whatever I need to do and I'm done with it because Photoshop is the hardest program in the world to me But I know that if I would have started learning Photoshop a little bit earlier I probably wouldn't have felt that way. Um, and so it just gets really frustrating um, for, for kids when you try to 
implement this new program and all this new technology and they have no experience with it and you expect them to create all of this fantastic stuff when, uh, especially when it comes to video, what you usually most likely get for kids who don't have any experience with it is a slideshow for with Google Images with a little piece of music behind it. Um, but if they start early and that's the first project that they do, then that's fine. But if you're, you're fresh, freshman year in college and that's all you come up with, it's just not very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. yeah, I feel like it's kind of difficult for me to speak about this because I'm not in a STEM field right now. But um, I do think that I just kind of want to keep keep going back to empowering and women and girls especially. Um, I feel like I can be confident in what I'm doing and who I am because I've had systems like the one that I'm in and the one that I have been in that. Um, make me feel valuable and make me feel like my voice matters and I keep going back to this but I think it's just so vital for youth especially girls and especially girls in um, STEM areas because I, I couldn't do it and I didn't learn it when I was in middle school either so that's probably why um, but yeah empowerment is key I think yeah Sarah I think for youth this is um, useful um, useful or important that some of my initial program experiences in unusual environments. Um, so when I could just try, and I, I knew thing I was scratch and to just play it down and just through this together. Um, and I felt like a lot of feelings of discovery. The first time I like really understood how to use loops. Um, and that might not have been a awesome you know, feeling of discovery that I would have gotten in like an, a lecture environment here um, in college. Um, so I think uh, I, I think a way that Scratch has benefited me uh, to this day is that I know uh, how exciting it is to uh, figure out something uh, because of these initial experiences I had. Natalie or Caitlin, did you want to weigh in on this question? Um, I was. This is making me think about um, kind of what all of you have touched on, but the importance of building, not only just having kids code or do the code, but building communities around that coding experience. I was sitting in on one of the digital divas classes that DYN offers, and one girl, they were working with circuits, and one girl thought she had it right, and the mentor came over and said, no, it's, it's not right, it doesn't light up, and the girl went from being excited to just pushing her chair back and saying, this is stupid, this is stupid, this is hard, I don't like this, I'm not going to take this. And the girl next to her said, no, 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 no. When you get it, it's really cool, it lights up. And then next we get to design a shirt or something. And so that building communities where it's the kids who can support each other and who have maybe different levels of expertise to keep going. Because I don't think that mentor could have come over and reassured that girl to keep going in the way that her peer did right next to her. Mm. And that was That's a great example. Yeah, again, I guess that's the thing where some of these stories, the narratives that I said that young people are saying, you know, I started in kindergarten, then I stopped, then my friend showed me all the cool things you could do on it, and then, and that there's an online site. So a lot of them maybe got introduced in school, and some of them got excited there, but some of them then didn't do it again until a friend show or cousin showed them, look what you can do, and there's this online site. So I, I agree that having this community and seeing something else, and we've also heard, I recently heard a teen, he, he started on a game, remixing a very complex game, and I was a little hesitant because it was very complex, and it was, he was just diving in. He said, this is the first time I've gotten excited about Scratch, and it was because he was starting with something that was already really cool, this escalator going up and all these things, and he was remixing it then for other youth, and he got really excited. So even though it was starting at a complex level, and we see that a lot, so starting with something that seems cool already, even mm -hmm. if it's more complicated, right, was right. a great starting point for right. him. Right, so seeing the value of lear the learning up front yeah. is but I, but I agree, important. I mean, and this is, yeah. you guys are reminding me about the ages, because he's in high school, and he did say, if I had done this mm -hmm. when I was younger, so That's he was really reflective on that. Yeah. So I think we need to think about that more. 
Yeah, and I think this is also, I mean, it's great to have a panel of young women who are bucking the trend, but we also have to really take a sobering look at the fact that the tech sector is becoming less and less diverse overall. So these are, you know, what we have in the room today are really our um, positive exceptions to the, the norm right now. And I think, you know, what I've seen in computer and tech and geek culture is the thing that's so wonderful about it is the peer-based sharing and support, but that also is exactly what makes it exclusionary, right? If you don't belong, if you don't have those geek friends, those geek networks, if that's not part of your identity, then it's really hard to find a way in without somebody building those contexts and relationships. So I think it really points to the fact that we have to look, you know, really think more systematically about building these kinds of environments where young people who are not already, you know, in the geek world and geek networks can, can have those peer supports because the purely formal instruction is not going to do it for um, kids who aren't already there to some extent. So this, is, this has been a really great reminder of some of those dynamics. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our time, but I wanted to give um, you know, all of our panelists just an opportunity for any last comment or word before we close. Um, I had one just off of what you were saying. I think that it's really important that, because um, you were like saying about the geek stuff, I think it's really important that we uh, work to change what the you know social stigma is towards that word and how people view it, especially um, for young kids, because being a geek isn't cool um, most of the time unless you're going to a tech school. Um, and you know, like I'm proud to be a geek, a nerd, or whatever you want to call it, and then that keeps me going forward. But a lot of kids, um, they don't feel that because especially when you're coming from urban communities, you know it's hard enough to, to feel proud about doing good in school. Um, and then now you're adding on the fact that you always have a laptop in your backpack, well, you know, that doesn't make you so cool either. And um, I think that's just one of the, the biggest challenges that comes with all of this is not getting them always to do the work, but getting them to be proud of it because when they're proud of it, then they, they do it on their own. Um, and so that, that's my last piece. That's a great reminder. Anybody, Jalouse, you want to jump in? Um, thank you for having us. <laughs> I don't, I'm really honored to be on this panel because, I don't know, you guys are really inspiring. And I'm only a freshman in, high, in college, but yeah, I, you're inspiring. <laughs> Sarah, do you have a parting word of wisdom for us? <laughs> um, just to go a little bit off of uh, what she said about um, changing, you know, the stigma behind the word geek, um, that's really important. The students that I work with now, um, you know, I, I see them every day. They live across the street. A lot of them live across the street, live in the neighborhood. They walk over there. But, you know, when they're at the clubhouse, that's a safe place for them to be able to work on whatever it is that they want to. Um, when I first started, there was um, one kid that I would have to beg to work on a project. I would have to, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And you're like, oh, no, I don't want to. Um, I'm actually going to be taking him to the Teen Summit this year. Um, he has really stepped up as a leader. You know, before, um, you know, he would tell me, oh, I got in a fight today, or I did this, or I did that, and he would be proud of that. Now what he's proud of is, oh, look, I fixed something in the music studio, or I just showed somebody how to make a beat. Um, you know, his brother was playing with uh, some of the Lego robotics, and he was like, do you know how to program it? And he said, no. He goes, you want to learn? He said, no. He's like, why not? And, you know, he's like, no, we're going to go learn this now. And so, you know, he's really stepped up as a leader. But, you know, the second somebody says, oh, you're a geek, then he'll immediately shut down and be like, no, I'm not. You know, I don't want to be here type thing. And so um, just really watching the way that we um, approach it, um, making it fun and relevant to the students will really engage them in the STEM activities um, that goes for the girls and the boys. But just, you know, making sure that we're making it centered around them and not what 
you know, the schools are telling them, oh, this is STEM, this is what you should be doing, but making sure that we engage them in what they're doing already in their everyday lives. Ooh, I think that's a fantastic and inspiring note to end on. So let's thank all of our panelists for sharing their experiences today.